Good evening and welcome to the New Mexico Philharmonic's Wednesday Night Live. My guest tonight is an amazing double bass player. He's the principal bass player from the Sao Paulo Municipal Symphony Orchestra, the orchestra from the Sao Paulo Opera House. We're going to start our show listening to Brian play two movements from Bach's cello suite number two. We'll hear first the Alamand and then the Minuet. Thank you. 
And here is my guest for tonight's show, principal bass player from the Sao Paulo Municipal Symphony Orchestra, Brian Fountain. Good evening, Brian, and welcome to our Wednesday night live. Well, hi, uh, good night, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Hello. Wonderful to have you in our show. This is the first time we have a solo double bass. I mean, we've had uh, trombones, we've had, uh, of course, uh, violinists, pianists, and uh, other instruments. So it's, a re it's really different for us to have a, a double bass and to hear beautiful solos played on the double bass. How did you choose, or how does someone choose to <laughs> be a double bass player? Brian, tell us, how did you start? Well, uh, yeah, it's not the most glamorous instrument, but somebody has to do it. Uh, <laughs> when I decided to play the bass, I didn't know I was making a life choice. I didn't know I was picking a career. I thought I was just picking an instrument for the summer for, you know, to play with my friends or whatever. And then I found out that you have to actually, you know, carry the thing around, move it around, try to get it in an airplane to Brazil. Uh, yeah, I found all that stuff out later. Well, you're an American uh, musician. Uh, you have you know, an extensive um, experience playing uh, you know, in orchestras. You were regularly playing with the Chicago Symphony, with the Milwaukee Symphony, the Virginia Symphony. Um, and then uh, all of a sudden you land in Brazil as a tourist and, uh, but then you become like, uh, you know, now more Brazilian than American since you've been living here for almost 10 years or even more than 10 years, right? Yeah, I think it's, I came in 2010, so it's almost, it's about 11 years now. It'll be, ele it'll be 11 years in like two weeks. Uh, yeah. Also, when I came to Brazil, I didn't know I, <laughs> I didn't know I was making a life decision. I thought I was just going for, for you know, for some fun. Uh, and I absolutely fell in love with it. And then that was 2000. I came twice as a tourist, 2008 and 2009. And then in 2010, the scene f was a little difficult in the United States. And there was sort of a, there was a long period with, with no real auditions for the orchestras there. And uh, it looked, there were lots of opportunities in Brazil and I thought, you know, I really liked it there a lot. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna give it a try. Uh, and then, then 11 years later, here I am, so. Well, fantastic. Where are you from in the United States? So this is common. This is super common in the United States. It's not so co common in Brazil, but I moved around a lot. My, my dad moved around a lot. So I was born in Wilmington, Delaware, but we moved from there before I turned one. We moved to Maryland and then from there to Michigan. Uh, and then I went to boarding school. I went to the Interlochen Academy for Music uh, in the north of Michigan. And then from there, I went to Hopkins in, Bal in Baltimore, Maryland. And I did a two year contract with the Chicago Symphony Orchestra in Chicago, but I stuck around for a number of years after that. So I tell people, sometimes I say I'm from Chicago just because that's where I live the longest. And completely separately, randomly, after I moved to Chicago, my mother also moved to Chicago. So I, I, it ended up home followed me there. <laughs> so I, I tell people I'm from Chicago, but the truth is I'm from all over, so. Moving to Brazil. Well, now you like, can say you come from the president's hometown, right? <laughs> that's true. That's true. My uncle. That's glamorous. I've been, posting it. <laughs> I've been posting it all over Facebook and social media. My uncle, my uncle's picture with, with Joe Biden. I'm going to post it tomorrow. Oh, I'm going to show you tomorrow. Cheers. Here's to Delaware. <laughs> cheers to Delaware. So, so coisa boa. Only good stuff. Exactly. Well, let's hear the first or watch the next uh, video, which is um, from uh, Glier, the prelude for double bass and piano. And uh, let's just surprise our audience. Let's not say anything else. Let's just watch this video. And we'll talk about it afterwards. Glier, prelude for bass and piano. <laughs>
That's such a beautiful work of Glier. A lot of people don't know Glier, um, but he's such a great composer. I think all of his pieces are great. You know, he wrote uh, ballets, symphonies, concertos. There's a beautiful concerto for French horn that I had the opportunity to perform many times myself. But what a great piece. But now, Brian, tell us, is that your twin brother on the piano or is that you playing both parts? That guy, Roberto, that guy has no idea how to play this piece. His concept of the piece is totally wrong. It's so difficult to work with him. <laughs> this, that, was, that was me and that was my, 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 what I made in the quarantine to, to pass the days there in March when we couldn't do anything. So I... Well, it, yeah. you sound great on both parts, I have to say, you know? And I didn't even know that you played the piano at all. So I was really very uh, uh, positively impressed. You know, congratulations, because, you know, it's such a difficult thing to, to, have, to be able to. And how did you do it? Did you first record the piano part and then yes, the bass? That, that's why I'm making all those weird faces uh, while I play the piano, because there's all these cadenzas. And I had to think really hard to imagine the bass part, for instance. The first eight measures, there's no piano. So I had to imagine the bass player playing so that I could play the piano and like it would, you know, hopefully work out in the end. Because if I didn't, if I didn't like focus very hard and visualizing the bass part, I would play the piano part too fast. 
So well, yeah, that's why. Thank God you why. you know the person you are accompanying pretty well. So you, <laughs> you know. Yeah. <laughs> That, that was really fun to watch. And um, now, when someone starts to study bass, you already know that you want to play in a symphony orchestra. I mean, unlike the violin or the cello or you know many of the wind, uh, woodwind instruments where players, they want to become soloists and have careers as soloists, a double bass player uh, mostly already thinks and directs his career towards being an orchestral player. Yeah. And yeah, that's what's true. Your... Uh, and the way that you play the instrument as a soloist and as an orchestral player are very different. And so when you're, when you're, when you take a job as a principal bass player, you have to keep both sets of skills in shape uh, because they will you will be called on to to play solo pieces uh and it's not really similar you could be a very very good orchestral bass player but not be able to execute maybe a a, a concerto especially the concertos by Barazzini because they're so high uh right. and you just spend the whole time you know doubled over uh and playing you know just it's it's almost like playing another instrument it's like having to to be able to play two instruments uh and then the other thing is a lot of frequently, as you know very well, because you hear auditions all the time, a lot of times somebody will come in in an audition and they'll play a, a great concerto. But then when it comes to playing the low stuff, it's not in tune or there's no clarity or it just doesn't have the same level of control. So you, a bass player who wants to take a principal job or who wants to maintain an active solo uh, you know, concerts on the side, has to keep both of these things in form and it's, a, it's definitely a challenge. The instruments do, I mean, the setup of the instrument is different. Right. Uh, the tuning is different. And so you need to be flexible to, to be able to go back and forth. Now the, the bass that you use in the orchestra, uh, remind me, do you use the five string bass or do you use the extension? I use the five string bass that, is, uh, that belongs to the Sao Paulo Opera House. Um, I know how to play on an extension. I, I did in the States play on an extension. Um, but basses come in all shapes and sizes and systems. There's people that play four string basses with an extension, four string basses, five string basses. There's people that play like Joel Corrington, who is, uh, Joel Cor Corrington, who is first bass in Toronto. He plays his bass tuned in fifths, which is coming in style now. Mm -hmm. Uh, and in the time of Barazzini, People would have played, he played a, a bass with three strings. And so when wow. I play, I'm going to play a, a Bodicini concerto on the 20th of March uh, in Sao Paulo with you. And I'm going to do it on a bass in three strings. And my bass is from this, ep from this time period uh, in Italy. Uh, my bass is from 1770. And wow. it is, it's, a very, it's a very great instrument, but these basses have a very thin uh, top. And so it was made to probably to have three strings. I have four strings on it, but I won't put a fifth string on it because I don't think it'll support the weight. Uh, but yeah, there are all kinds of systems and ways that people, there's even people playing five string basses now tuned in fifths. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Fascinating, I know. <laughs> so people don't know how important the double bass is for the symphony orchestra. It is one of the most important instruments in your orchestra because it has the lower pitch. I mean, it really has the, the, the roots uh, of the harmony and it's essential for the intonation of the entire orchestra. So it's, it's a big responsibility. Yeah, it's also one of the oldest instruments in the orchestra. But the, the importance of the bass, you can see it in how many uh, different kinds of music you find it. You find it in, it's, the old, it's probably maybe not the oldest, but one of the oldest instruments in the orchestra. It's older than the violin. Maybe it's a viol. It's from the gamba family, tuned in fourths. Mm -hmm. um, you see basses in obviously every period of classical music, but also in jazz, you see it in bluegrass, you see it in so many different forms of music. And there's so many of these bass players from other styles that right. come into the community, you know? So if you're on like the double bass forums, 
uh, like I am, uh, you will you ha you deal with a lot of jazz players, a lot of electric bass players. You deal with a lot of people that play bluegrass or rockabilly, which is really in style now. Uh, and so the instrument, the the importance of the instrument is really your image got you can, a little. Uh, it's okay. Is it okay? Yes. Now that you're back, now you you got frozen for for a few seconds, and. You know, of course, I mean, from uh, Bach and Vivaldi and Handel, you know, going on to the, the classical period with Mozart, Haydn, but then we get to Beethoven, and Beethoven revolutionized the bass writing. I think we lost Brian there for a bit. So oh. I was saying, Brian, that how revolutionary Beethoven was for the double bass because he wrote bass parts that nobody imagined uh, writing before him. Yes, he, he, his, he was friends with Dragonetti. He knew Dragonetti, who was one of the first bass virtuosos. And so knowing now, thanks Dragonetti, he, he, he informed Beethoven that all these things were possible. And so Beethoven made sure to make sure that all of us will study that for the rest of our lives and play those extra hard nine symphonies. Uh, well, thanks for Dragonetti, you know, for influencing Beethoven in such a powerful way. We're going to watch now a video um, of Brian leading the section of the Sao Paulo Symphony Orchestra and at the recitative of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony in the fourth movement, because that's such a protagonistic part for the celli, for the violoncellos and the, the basses of the orchestra, one of the most difficult passages in all of the symphonic literature. So this is a concert we played in Sao Paulo about a year and a half ago. So it's a live performance from the Opera House in Sao Paulo. Let's watch that now.
what a great bass part, Brian. And you know, you guys nailed that. It sounded so incredible. So cheers, cheers to Beethoven and uh, bass parts. <laughs> to Beethoven. So Brian, and Dragonetti. all your exactly. In all your travels and your experience going all over the world, it must not be easy to transport the bass, right? Can you tell us, um, you know, some funny story or something that you have experienced and now you can laugh at? <laughs> yes, I can laugh at it today because, <laughs> because at the time it was not, it was not at all, it was not definitely not laughing. But when the first time I took my bass to Brazil in 2010, uh, I booked a flight and this flight had a, I was going to Belo Horizonte, which is the capital of the state of Minas Gerais. Um, and since there's no direct flights from the, or the, back then there were no direct flights from the United States to Belo Horizonte, I had to connect in, I think Rio, and then uh, take a smaller plane to Belo Horizonte. But this smaller wow. plane, I don't know if everybody knows, has ever seen a flight case for a base, but the flight cases, they are, they are, they look like a coffin. They're, they're like a white plastic coffin. Um, and they don't, they don't, they don't fit in the overhead luggage compartment. Um, <laughs> of course. So they also, as it turns out, do not fit in an Airbus 320, which is what the plane was that flies from Rio to Belarusanch. So, oh my it, God. so because of that, uh, they had some kind of a weight, a weight limit or size limit, but you know, I didn't speak any Portuguese at that time. And so after a very long drawn out, you know, emotional bargaining session with, with, the, with the flight crew, they allowed me to take my base out of the flight case. They would put the flight case in the plane, in the cargo hold. And then I had to take the base into the cabin and I had to put it with the neck with the scroll of the instrument down where the feet go. And then I had to hold it the whole flight <laughs> that way. Oh my God. That, yeah, it was, it was well, very luckily intense. It was not a, a, a long flight. It was only about an hour, no. right? Yeah, short, short flight. Thank God. No, so if oh. it was a longer flight, it'd probably be a bigger plane. So, but. <laughs> well, did you take advantage? Did you practice during your flight or did you have did some not. live music going on? <laughs> No, I, I did Zen meditation, tried to ho hope that everything was going to get there in one piece. <laughs> hope that I wouldn't have to go through this on the way back. <laughs> yeah. Now, Brian, besides uh, your love and passion for the double bass, you're also an athlete. Uh, you're a bodybuilder and you spend yeah. countless hours at the gym every day. Can you tell us about your at this other uh, passion of yours. Yeah, uh, I am going, I, I do physique competitions. Uh, my category is men's physique, which is the smallest category. There's like men's physique, classic physique and bodybuilder, I'm the smallest category. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, my, my stress release or whatever. I used to do jujitsu, I used to do Mai Tai. Uh, oh, wow. I really like jujitsu, but the last time I did jujitsu, was actually opening night of Rigoletto. I don't know, I played Rigoletto with you and there's a right. bass solo. <laughs> and that morning at 7 a.m. I went to Jiu Jitsu and I dislocated my shoulder. <laughs> oh and my God. The I never first knew thing that. was like, oh my God, yeah. Well, because it didn't turn into a problem because I, I dislocated my shoulder in a fight and the uh, sensei, Is the black that Brazilian belt who runs the class. Or yeah. Was that Brazilian Jiu Jitsu? Okay. Yeah. He just popped it right back in. And actually like 30 minutes later, I didn't feel anything. And I played just fine. I mean, wow. there's no problem. But I did, I did have to sort of realize that uh, jujitsu is not gonna, it's not, it's, it's just too dangerous to do wow. uh, as, a, as a string player, uh, especially with your hands and your arms. Anyway, uh, so I do, so I moved to bodybuilding, which actually, before I moved to Brazil, I was about to compete, but then I moved to Brazil and it kind of got put on hold. Uh, but I find it super similar to being a musician, actually. I don't think it's, I, I don't think it's that different at all. Uh, it's a lot of daily training um, for like, you train, you know, months and weeks, um, years 
for a, a performance that's like five minutes. <laughs> you know? So it does have so, sort of parallels to, to, to being a musician. Um, and you have to lead with the, the uh, risk of injury. I don't know. I think of playing the bass as kind of a sport. I don't separate it out that much. So I, I have to pace myself. I have to take care of chronic injuries that I have. I have to, you know, I'm getting older, so I have to make sure that I'm playing in a way that is going to be sustainable as I get older. Uh, and I need to keep, you know, certain skills in in Well, in this next video, in this next video we're going to watch, we get to see uh, Brian's figure and his muscles uh, besides listening to him perform. So this is now um, a video with Bottezini, the elegy in D major for double bass and piano. Let's watch it. Thank you. 
Well, you sounded great, Brian, and you looked great uh, on this video. So congratulations. <laughs> Cheers to you. Um, now, there's a sad story. There's, unfortunately, there's a very sad story um, um, with this video and with our beloved pianist, Rafael Andrade, who is accompanying you in the video that we just watched. So would you mind sharing that with us? Yeah, uh, Rafael uh, passed away, I guess it would be about three months now uh, during the, the pandemic, he was hospitalized for COVID and he was actually let go from the hospital. He, he apparently recovered, but then short time later, he, he had some kind of a, a heart problem and he passed away. Um, and Rafael was a, a pretty important figure uh, here in the music scene in Brazil. He was a vocal coach and a chamber pianist. He was at one time, he, he was one of the pianists that prepared, prepared the singers for Teatro Mispal. And I always, I like to work with him a lot because he had a, a very natural musicality. He understood these, you know, operatic pieces that, uh, like that one that I just played, but uh, in general, he had an excellent sense for 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 voice, um, and it was a very big loss. Uh, so we are still in mourning for for Rafael. Yeah, Rafael was a marvelous pianist. He worked for many years at the Opera House, uh, accompanying, coaching singers, preparing them for our um, for several of our opera productions, and he was. Um, in his early 30s, very young man, um, you know, full of energy, full of life, life, you know, a very happy uh, person, a delightful, a delightful person uh, to be around. And tragically, you know, he did have COVID. He was hospitalized, but he went home, and just a few days later, tragically, he suffered a heart attack and left us. So. Um, we, we um, remember Rafael, and I'd like to lift our glasses now and toast here to Rafael Andrade, our beloved friend. To Rafael. Um, but, you know, we've been, of course, um, uh, doing different things during uh, the pandemic. Uh, thank God at the Opera House in Sao Paulo, we were able to come back to work. You know, respecting the social distancing with very um, restrict uh, protocols for the security. And, uh, but we're now also open to the public so we can have 20%, 25% uh, of the capacity of the Opera House uh, attending. So we have around uh, 370 people attending each concert. We're gonna have a concert tomorrow evening and on Friday evening, uh, Brian is performing uh, Ravel's Mamelwea and uh, Schumann's The Spring Symphony, Symphony Number no. One. We're very excited and looking forward. The re orchestra is a bit reduced. We're uh, just about uh, close to 50 players right now, but it's such a privilege to be able to, to be back. And in New Mexico, in Albuquerque, we cannot wait with the great New Mexico Philharmonic and with a wonderful audience um, to resume our concerts. So we're looking forward. I hear that, you know, due to the vaccination, things are already better in the United States. Thank God. And uh, we're hoping that we can come back as soon as possible. Maybe as early as June or July, we can already start having our concerts. Um, so Brian, it's been great to have you on this show. Thank you so much for participating. Thank you for having me. Thanks, everybody. And, you know, you are one of the most valuable players in our orchestra because you're so dedicated. Uh, of course, you perform with so much passion and you lead your section so beautifully, but you also lead the Musicians Committee as president of the Musicians Association, and you're doing such a tremendous job with that. So I'd like to take the, this opportunity to thank you for all that you're bringing and uh, your... Uh, in, the, all the time. That you're investing just to, you know, we really appreciate that. And I'm sure 
everybody is uh, very happy to have you um, in the leadership of the Musicians Committee. So thank you so much. Uh, we're going to end our show with another video of Brian, and it's a fantastic video where he performs a piece originally composed for violin and piano from Fritz Kreisler, the prelude uh, for violin and piano played by Brian Fountain on the bass. So with that, we will say goodbye to all of you, and we're looking forward to our next show next week. So everybody, thank you for joining us for tonight's show. And remember, stay healthy, stay safe. Good night, everyone. Good night, Brian. Thank you so much. Good night. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.